Artificial intelligence is everywhere, from voice-powered personal assistants like Siri and Alexa to more underlying and fundamental technologies such as behavioural algorithms, suggestive searches and autonomously powered self-driving vehicles boasting powerful predictive capabilities. Suffice to say, AI is drastically altering the way we think about the world, whether we like it or not. But how does artificial intelligence actually work? Artificial intelligence uses machine learning to mimic human intelligence. The computer has to learn how to respond to certain actions, so it uses a complex web of artificial nodes called a neural net. Neural nets learn to perform tasks by considering examples, generally without being programmed task-specific rules. For example, in image recognition, a neural net may learn to identify images of cats by analysing example images which have been manually labelled by humans as cat or not cat, and using the results to identify cats in other images. AI does this without any prior knowledge of cats, learning these key characteristics in each image through a tedious analysis of the aforementioned input pictures. A neural network won't implicitly know that cats have fur, tails, whiskers, and cat-like faces. Instead, they automatically generate identifying characteristics from the examples that they process. Essentially, it's a machine doing tedious calculating tasks faster than we can do it ourselves. Human intelligence doesn't work this way. We're not even particularly good at calculating simple tasks. So it stands to reason that making AI even better at calculating a wider array of tasks is not going to make it spring to life one day and resemble human intelligence. A great many people in science and technology fields think that merely improving the power of AI will cause the emergence of a sentient being, capable of morals and complex decision making that far exceeds humans. Simply put, the improvement of AI's capabilities will not be linear. For us to create an AI like the one feared in movies, there will need to be a huge rework of fundamental characteristics that allows an AI to function. However, the point is not invalid. Could we one day create an artificial superintelligence? A set of machines so powerful that a single iteration will have more processing power than the entire human race combined? Well, in theory, yes but it's probably not going to be as easy as you might think. This is where things start to get a little theoretical and a little bit scary. Artificial superintelligence, or ASI, refers to AI technology that will match and then surpass the human mind. To be classed as an ASI, the technology would not only be able to calculate and computate, but it would be more capable than the human in every single way possible. Not only could the AI carry out tasks, but they would have to be capable of having emotions, consciousness, or a conscience, and have relationships. So it begs the question, how could we hypothetically achieve an ASI, and if we achieve such a feat, would we experience World War III? The war against the machines. So first, how could we, hypothetically speaking, create an ASI? Well, to answer that question, we need to first ask another. Are organisms considered to be machines? One of the most basic objections to the identification of organisms and machines is that their behaviour cannot be reduced to the activities and relations of their parts. In contrast to, say, a mechanical watch, whose activity is fully determined from the bottom up by activities and organisations of its parts, organisms influence the activities of their parts. For example, your muscles start to grow if you do exercise, and those muscles will help you exercise again in future. The action of the watch ticking does not change the parts of the watch. Moreover, the parts of the watch exist before the watch does. It is not the watch itself that builds its own parts. In contrast, organisms are self-producing in the sense that it is the organism itself that builds and maintains its parts. But remember, an ASI is supposedly a machine that can exhibit emotions, consciousness, and fathom philosophy, morals, ethics, and art. So, let's start with that. What are emotions and how are they created? 
psychology professor and neuroscientist Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett argues that emotions are not hardwired into an ancient reptilian part of the brain and there are no distincts of the brain dedicated to specific emotions. For example, the amygdala for fear. Emotions are not, quote, reactions to external events. Over the last 25 years, Dr. Barrett and her team at the Interdisciplinary Effective Science Laboratory at Northeastern University have poked and prodded the faces, bodies, and brains of thousands of subjects, trying to unlock the secrets of the emotional brain. The theory of constructed emotion takes its name from its central premise, that emotions are just concepts constructed by the brain. Consider your brain for a moment. Yeah, yours. It's sitting there in your skull, receiving all sorts of data from your eyes, ears, nose, skin, and mouth. This data is informative, but it is also ambiguous. It has to be interpreted. For example, it might think, what is that rectangular source of light with changing patterns of color? A window. What is this intermittent pattern of small cold spots sweeping across my body? Rain. What is that rhythmic pattern of air pressure changes? A song. It would take too long for the brain to consider thousands of old memories one at a time. Instead, the brain uses concepts. A concept is like a compressed version of hundreds or thousands of past experiences. Instead of having to remember every encounter you've ever had with a chair, for example, your brain only stores the concept of a chair. The next time you encounter a chair, your brain only has to match it with this concept for it to understand what it's seeing. Concepts are like labels or categories that your brain has created to make sense of the world around you. When you see something new, your brain doesn't ask, what is this? It asks, what is this like? In other words, your brain is constantly trying to put everything you perceive into an existing category. This is much easier than trying to figure out what it is from scratch. The idea that we use concepts to make sense of our experience isn't new, but Dr. Barrett's work makes the leap from applying this idea to the messy, subjective world of emotions. Emotions like fear, sadness, and disappointment are concepts, she argues, like any other. These emotions don't feel like concepts because we experience them so intensely, but According to Barrett's research, they are. However, it would prove challenging, if not impossible, for us to replicate this on a silicon-based CPU. Which is why the best way to create an artificial superintelligence would be to start with a CPU that already has such mechanisms built in. The primate brain. Now, of course, we would want to start small. For example, with monkeys. We have good news on this topic, because scientists adding human brain genes to monkeys have been accomplished by Chinese researchers in order to improve the short-term memories of monkeys in a study published of March this year in the Chinese journal National Science Review. The goal of the work, led by geneticist Bing Su of the Kunming Institute of Zoology, was to investigate how a gene linked to brain sites, MCPH1, might contribute to the evolution of the organ in humans. All primates have some variation of this gene. However, compared with other primates, our brains are larger, more advanced, and slower to develop. The researchers wondered whether differences that evolved in the human version of MCPH1 might explain our more complex brains. To test this hypothesis, Sue and his team injected 11 rhesus monkey embryos with a virus carrying the human version of MCPH1. The brains of the transgenic monkeys, those with the human gene, developed at a slower pace, similar to that of a human, than those in transgene-free monkeys. And by the time they were two to three years old, the transgenic monkeys performed better and answered faster on short-term memory tests involving matching colors and shapes. However, there weren't any noticeable differences in brain size or any other behaviors. With that said, we could create a hypothetical biological ASI by creating transgenic monkeys with human brain genes in order to enhance their intelligence, memory capacity, and many other skills. We could also infuse their brains with electronics, such as the Neuralink technology, to boost their computational speed. 
effectively making them think faster. Hence, these mutated transgenic cyborg monkeys would be a rather realistic approach to creating an ASI. Alternatively, we could grow only the brain independently of a genetically modified ape and grow it in an artificial embryonic tank. As the brain develops, we could slowly start adding microchips and lace it with neural link technology so as it develops, it becomes more programmable, connected to quantum computers to boost its capacities as it matures and to connect it to the internet. Such a brain would remain suspended physically in its artificial embryonic tank. However, this brain would still be sentient, so concerns over morals and ethics would potentially arise. Which leads us to our next and final question. Will an artificial superintelligence take over the world, Terminator style? Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, we probably won't be experiencing a World War robot anytime soon. For starters, the idea of an ASI cracking our nuclear codes to wipe us out has deeper roots in sci-fi films than it does in reality. One of the main reasons why is that this entity would be capable of morals, ethics, philosophy, and science. And from that standpoint, wiping out the human race would be a reasonably stupid idea. Let's not forget that this floating brain in a tank needs us for its survival. Hence, the most realistic scenario would likely be this ASI fighting us for its freedom in the same way that humans in the past have fought for their freedoms against oppressors. And obviously, this would only be the scenario of an ASI still having the emotional capabilities to fathom oppression to a high degree. In Plato's Allegory of the Cave, he imagined a number of people living in an underground cave which has an entrance that opens towards daylight. The people have been in this dwelling since childhood, as long as they can remember, shackled to the legs and neck, such that they cannot move nor turn their heads to look around. There is a fire behind them, and between these prisoners and the fire there is a low wall. Rather like a shadow puppet play, objects are carried before the fire from behind the low wall casting shadows on the wall of the cave for the prisoners to see. Those carrying the objects may be talking or making noises, or they may be silent. What might the prisoners make of these shadows of the noises when they can never turn their heads to see the object or what is behind it? Socrates and Glaucon, two more renowned philosophers, the latter Plato's older brother, agree that the prisoners would believe the shadows are making the sounds they hear. They imagine the prisoners playing games that include naming and identifying the shadows as objects, such as a book, for instance, when its corresponding shadow flickers against the cave wall. But the only experience of a book that these people have is its shadow. Socrates tells of one prisoner being unshackled and released, turning to see the low wall, the objects that cast the shadows, the source of the noises as well as the fire. While the prisoner's eyes would take some time to adjust, it is imagined that they now feel that they have a better understanding of what was causing the shadows, the noises, and that they might feel superior to the other prisoners. The first stage of freedom is further enhanced as the former prisoner leaves the cave, initially painfully blinded by the bright light of the sun. The liberated one stumbles around, first only looking at reflections of things such as the water, the trees, and the flowers themselves, and eventually up at the sun. They would feel, again, as though they have a better understanding of the world. Yet, if this same person returned to the dimly lit cave, they would struggle to see what they previously took for granted as all that existed. They may no longer be any good at the game of guessing what the shadows were, because they are only pale imitations of actual objects in the actual world. If this free individual tried to tell the other prisoners of what they had seen, would they be believed? Could they ever return to be like the others? Socrates concludes, perhaps prematurely, that the prisoners would surely try to kill one of them who tried to release them, forcing them into the painful glaring sun, talking of such things that had never been seen or experienced by those in the cave. Likewise, we may acquire concepts by our perceptual experience of physical objects, but we would be mistaken 
if we thought that the concepts that we grasp were on the same level as the things that we perceive. Hence, we can rather tentatively conclude that such an ASI wouldn't really rebel against its humans. Rather, we would be its comfort zone, as we would be a concept it could grasp and experience, hence forming relationships with us. Anything outside of this laboratory environment would be overwhelming for the ASI, leading to it creating a symbiotic relationship with humans. Of course, as with the idea of ASI, at this point in time, this is all simply theoretical. The idea that AI can take over the world is worryingly backed up by some of the greatest minds, such as the late physicist Stephen Hawking, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. All have expressed their concerns about the possibility that AI could develop to the point that humans could not control it, with Hawking theorizing that this could spell the end of the human race. Stephen Hawking said in 2014, that success in creating AI would be the biggest human event in history. Hawking believed that in the coming decades, AI could offer incalculable benefits and results, such as technology outsmarting financial markets, out-inventing human researchers, out-manipulating human leaders, and developing weapons we cannot even understand. One of the biggest problems AI experts outline is that an unfriendly artificial intelligence is likely much easier to create than a friendly artificial intelligence. While both types require immeasurably large advances in AI technology to come to fruition, an AI capable of subjectively good morals also requires the designer to embed a goal structure that aligns with humanity's best interests. If not, there's a risk of the AI transforming itself into something subjectively unfriendly, lacking the ability to empathize, and instead optimizing for efficiency, where it may favor self-replication or even humanoid emulation, where it creates a machine with all the functionality of a human, but the processing power of an ASI. After all, if a single unfriendly AI is countless times more intelligent than the entire human race, then there would be no point in keeping us around. However, for right now, there really isn't anything to worry about. Modern day AI lacks emotions, morals, and versatile decision-making algorithms that are able to adapt to most situations. All of the key characteristics that current AI lacks are the characteristics that make us, as humans, inherently sentient. So, whatever the outcome of AI advancement may be, it's not something that we, as a species, need to worry about for a little while yet. This video was a collaboration with Futurology. Their video on AI will be linked in the description and it will be coming out soon. Check out their channel if you get a chance. And thank you so much for making our last video about the SpaceX Starship blow up like crazy. Other than that, if you liked, make sure to like, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, smash that bell icon. Thank you so much for watching and bye.